Well now, as you know, the subject this morning is what to do with the burden. And we know that we all have burdens to bear and we know that wisdom consists in doing the right thing with them, in knowing what to do with them. But we needn't think that we have to discover this wisdom for ourselves. It has been discovered long ago and by many people. And Christians know, for example, that in the scriptures and in the great heroes of the faith, we have the example of men and women who did splendidly with the burdens they had to carry. And this morning we're going to notice how the psalmist, the great apostles Paul and Peter, and our Lord himself, give us a good example uh, by which we can learn uh, to deal with the burdens that come to us. So I've got three points for you this morning. The first one is by far the longest, and then there is a shorter one, and then the last one is just a wee teeny weeny one. And when we've come to the end of those, that will be the service. So what to do with the burden? And here's the first thing. The first thing we, we have to do with it is to bear it. Listen to Paul. Everyone has his own proper burden. His own proper burden to bear. There's a burden that nobody else can carry for us and that nobody else ought to carry for us. Every man has his own proper burden to bear. But if you were, for example, to read Barclay's translation of the New Testament or J.B. Phillips, you would discover another word. What they say to us is this. Each man must carry his own pack. You know how it is when you're sitting around the fire in the summertime and you're having a good sing-song or you're at home around the piano, sooner or later you begin to sing the old song from the First World War, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Now, says the great apostle, you're like a soldier. And a soldier has to carry his own pack. So you bear your own burden. Now what this tells us is something that we need to hear. It tells us that we are responsible for ourselves. The Stoics used to say this. I've mentioned this to you before. The Stoics would say, it doesn't really matter about your circumstances, the things outside you. What really matters is that you are a rational creature and therefore you have the wisdom to say, whatever these circumstances over which I have no control, I choose my environment from them. I determine which elements from my circumstances will shape my life and attitude. That's what you do as a reasonable creature because you're responsible for yourself. So don't blame your circumstances. Eleanor Roosevelt put it splendidly. She said, will you just remember that nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. And Paul learned that from the Stoics. He puts it differently. He says, let the peace of God stand guard over your hearts and thoughts. In other words, it doesn't matter what comes to hammer and batter at the doors of life. Make them pass the test of the peace of God and if they don't pass, don't let them in. You are responsible for yourself. You must carry your own proper burden. Now, we need to notice this because in our time, it seems that we're always trying to get other people to accept responsibility for us. Sometimes it's the government. We know that one of the awful temptations of the welfare state, and it has many benefits, but one of the awful weaknesses of it is that it encourages people to think that always there'll be somebody else to look after them. So they don't need to carry their own burdens. Somebody else will carry their burdens for them. Or maybe it's the stars. I'm Pisces. What are you? That's the trouble with me. I'm Pisces. I mean, don't blame me. It's all in the stars. That's what shapes our temperament. Or maybe it's heredity. The genes and chromosomes. Or environment about which it seems people say we can do. Or maybe we are behaviorist psychologists. And that just means that thought is an impulse of the brain and it means an end of truth and freedom and responsibility. So, you see, we hand the responsibility for ourselves over to somebody or 
some other impersonal force. And we forget that we are responsible for ourselves, that we have ourselves on our hands. Now, someone has suggested that that's one of the reasons why the play A Man for All Seasons is a very popular play indeed. Because there we see a man who really was responsible for himself in Sir Thomas More. As Robert Bolt tells us, he knew his own dimensions. He knew where he started and where he left off. He knew that area where he located himself. And from that, he would not retreat one inch. So we love to read about it. Somebody said once that the thing that most people are trying to hide is something that isn't even there. It's our emptiness. We don't know where we begin or where we end. We have a diminished sense of self and responsibility for self. And so we look to Sir Thomas More or we look to others. And we discover our sense of selfhood and of carrying our own burdens vicariously. Sometimes think that that's part of the enormous appeal of professional sport. You know what it's like in the World Series how everybody's predicting the outcome, and the papers are full of it. And the enormous crowd, and it's there on television, millions of people are looking in. And there's the pre-game show, and then the national anthem, and then the teams are in, and then the pitcher has his warm-up pitches, and then the batter comes to the plate, and then it all comes down to one man, the pitcher, and whether or not on that particular day he's got his good stuff, and nobody can help. He's on his own. Now, I disapprove of boxing in a hypocritical kind of way. I can't resist the drama of it. You know how it is when they say seconds out, is there any more dramatic sound than the bell to start the first round and a fighter comes out into the ring and all he has is what he has in himself, his strength of body and his courage of heart and there's nobody else to help him. Randy Turpin said once when he fought Sugar Ray Robinson for the world middleweight title and Robinson came to England with a pink Cadillac, would you believe it? And his own, his own hairdresser, he wasn't even a barber, with his own hairdresser to look after him. And this entourage of hangers-on. And Turpin was up training in the Welsh mountains and somebody said to him, what do you think of all this? And he said with ungrammatical profundity, you know, when we get into the ring, there's only him and me. What do you think of the kicker in the, um, in the Super Bowl? a few seconds left and the score is tied and this field goal will win the game and so there are millions looking on and he knows he's got to do it it will be the last play of the game we've all seen it happen and the opposition they call a time out to give him time to think about it and then at last he comes up to kick and everything happens everything depends on and nobody can help him he's got to do it himself Now we see this in professional sports, but it really is part of your experience and mine too. Some of you are students. And you know what it is to write an examination, don't you? And you know that nobody can help you. You go in and you lift the paper and you try to come to terms with your sense of shock. <laughs> you wonder whether you've wandered into the wrong examination. <laughs> and and you know yourself to be on any human aid and you're convinced that you're even beyond any hope of divine aid. And there's only you and your own head and your own pencil and the empty paper and you've got to do it and nobody can help you. You've got to carry your own burden. And some of us are preachers and some of you are teachers and some of you are performers. And you know the very same thing. I mean, Finally, the moment comes when you've done all your preparation and all the hymns have been sung or you've been introduced or the class has sat down ready to listen to you. Do you know what you've got to do? You've got to open your mouth and say something. And sometimes it's glorious. And the words come chasing you. You can't get them out quickly enough. 
And sometimes you chase them and you know you haven't a hope of catching them. And sometimes it's splendid and you wouldn't do anything else for the world because you're alive. And sometimes the concert platform and this pulpit and the teacher's lectern can be the loneliest and most vulnerable place in the whole world. I know a minister, and if I were to mention his name to you, you would know him at once because he's world famous. And one Sunday morning, he was preaching to his congregation, and it just became too much for him. It came over him like a wave of desolation, and he simply turned and walked away, and his assistant finished the service. Now, every performer and every preacher and every teacher knows what that means. We know that we have our own burden to bear and that there is nobody else can do it for us. Now, here's what I want us to notice also. That that's not simply the exercise of a particular function. That's part of being human. I mean, it's true of all of us. Nobody knew this better than Soren Kierkegaard, the melancholy Dane. He writes most beautifully of how he used to love to go to the seaside and listen to the song of the seabirds. And sometimes they simply sang to him of his kinship with nature. And at other times he tells us the song of the sea muse reminded him that he was alone. He could go with his friends and be the life and soul of the party. But then he writes of that midnight hour when all masks come off. And some of us have noticed that when we've tried to care for people who are ill or suffering or bereaved or dying. And you know what you try to do? You try to come to them as try to come as close to them as you can not only in feeling, but, but in place, and you're just a few inches away, and so are their dear ones, and they're all trying by love to come as close as they can come. And all the time what's in my mind is that there is a great gulf fixed between us, and you can't get over it, because... They are sorrowful. It's their sorrow and only they can bear it. It isn't my sorrow. It is their pain and not mine. I don't feel it. They must bear it. It is their death and not mine and they must die it. So that however close you seek to come, what you're aware of is that They are alone, and they must carry the burden alone. Now, you see, it's not only a part of our humanity, and it's not only burdens outside ourselves that we have to bear. There are not only sightings without, there are fears within. And sometimes when we look for our spiritual burden, we find that what we have to carry is attitudes and feelings and actions that that spring up from within ourselves that we can't really do very much with. And they are a burden, and there's no getting away from them. For example, I know a young man who is inordinately sensitive. He is very finely tuned, and because he is so finely tuned, he is a superb musician. But he's doing a kind of work in which criticism is inevitable. There is no way that he can do it without criticism. And it just destroys him. He is so sensitive. But you see, that burden is one that he'll have to carry and it rises up from within himself. Have you ever had to come and recognize that in spite of all your hopes and aspirations, you really didn't have a first-rate mind? You had to recognize the fact that it was second rate or maybe even third rate. And that's a burden that you have to carry. Some people go through life and all their days they've had this awful sense of inferiority and that's what they have to carry. And now and then it seems that they've had a victory over it. But then when they find themselves threatened and vulnerable, there it is in all its 
uncomfortable, menacing, distressing horror. And they are diminished. And they know that they have to carry this. I know a girl who is enormously gifted in imagination. And because she's so imaginative, her life is just filled with fears. I mean, by her gift of imagination, she finds things to be afraid of that you and I would never think of. You know, some people think that they're, that they're courageous when it's simply that they lack imagination. Some people are not imaginative enough to be afraid. But here is a girl who was just filled with imagination and, and so she encounters so many fears. I know a young man who has great gifts of mind and spirit and personality. He has great gifts of character. He is a fine person. And yet he's uneasy with members of the opposite sex. And because he's uneasy, they don't find him very attractive. And that's the burden that he's carrying. And he watches other young people, less gifted, far more superficial than he is, finding companionship and love and marriage while all the time he is lonely. Here is a person who is a perfectionist. Do you think perfectionists are hard to live with? Perfectionists find it even more difficult to live with themselves. He is constantly driven to be 101%. And he can't do it. And that's the burden of his life. What are we going to do with these things? What do we do with these burdens outside and inside? Well, the answer is that we bear them. We acknowledge them. We look them straight in the face and we say, well, that's the way it is and that's what it is I've got to cope with and it's a matter of my own self and integrity and strength that's well, on the line here. And so it is, we bear them. Herbert Gray came to the knowledge one day that he didn't have a first-rate mind. It was second or third, maybe even fourth-rate, he said. But then I got to thinking about this and I had to think that God must have some use for people like that. I mean, he made so many of us. <laughs> and that maybe the most important thing was not the kind of work that I do, but that whatever I do, there's always an opportunity to love. William Barclay said, the great New Testament scholar, he said, one day I had to acknowledge the fact that I hadn't a first-rate mind. I was not creative. It was not a seminal mind. It didn't pioneer with sharp thrusts into new truth. Nothing like that. But I also discovered that I had a marvelous gift of organizing what other people thought and of making it simple so that ordinary people could understand. So I decided to do that. He's written about 40 books. He's one of the most helpful and one of the best of New Testament scholars, you see. And so it is, we say, well, what are we going to do with these? Well, we're going to make the best of them. That's what we're going to do, says Hammer Showed. Says Hammer Showed. Got to recognize that we've got to carry our own birth. So you're lonely? Let me ask you, what is the quality of your loneliness? Do you fill it with self-pity? Or do you allow your loneliness to become your strength? As loneliness is the strength of God. So you're empty, are you? Well, how are you going to fill your emptiness, he asks. Are you going to fill it merely with disgust at your emptiness? Or are you going to pursue those qualities of character that will fill it up with strength and grace? So you're carrying the burden of age, are you? How do you reckon your age? By the weakness of your body or by the strength of your spirit? So you're dying? And what is your death? Is it something that happens to you merely? Or is it something that you accomplish as our Lord accomplished his death in Jerusalem with serenity and grace? So you are a perfectionist. And what's it doing? Does it give you a sense of quality? And do you elevate your own work and the work of other people? Ach, you're imaginative, are you? And it fills your life with fears. But don't you see a glory that nobody else can see? And can't you share it with them? So you're an introvert, given to self-doubt and to sense of inferiority and to indecision. 
but oh, what insight it can bring you into the hurts of other people and what sympathy they can find in your experience. Do you see what I'm saying? These are the burdens, and the first thing we must do with them is bear them, because every soldier has to carry his own pack. So, let me sum up my first point. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Because that brings me to the second thing. The next thing we have to do is not only to bear it, but to share our burdens. And there isn't any doubt at all about the kind of burdens that Paul is talking about. He says, we must bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What burden? It is the burden of the man who has slipped up. Now, I use the words advisedly. Usually, he walks steadily, but he slipped. The very word is most appropriate for a day like this. The very word that Paul uses is for a person who has slipped on a, on a slippery road. Now, I'm usually pretty steady, but a few months ago, I was visiting in Westminster Hospital and tried to leap over a snowbank and underestimated my age. And I fell. There was a member of the choir on her way to rehearsal for Samson, and she slipped and fell and broke her hip. We visited her hospital this week. People who are normally steady can slip now, says Paul, when a person makes a moral slip. What you have to do is, listen, correct him. Correct him. So you bear his burden. Do you know the word he uses for correct? You see, Paul kept company with Luke, and Luke was a doctor. And when you keep company with doctors, you begin to talk like them. And the word is used for a, a doctor who sets a broken limb. So here's a man who has slipped up, and he's broken a limb. Now, says Paul, if you'll just help to fix that, you will bear his burden, and you will fulfill the law of Christ, the law that we should love one another. I wish we'd do this. You know, sometimes it seems to me that even in the church, sometimes it seems to me that especially in the church, we are so concerned to judge and blame and condemn and have so little grace. It's true of ministers. One of the things I hate about being a minister is that for some people, not I hope for those who know me, but for some people being a minister means that I'm a professional holy man and that therefore my function is to judge and blame and condemn. Some people would no more think of telling their shame and sin to a minister than they would of telling it to a policeman or a judge. And some ministers deserve it. I love the story about the group of theological students from Richmond College in England. And at the break of the second outbreak of the Second World War, they decided to enlist, so they all went down to the recruiting officer and they were all wearing their clerical collars. And of course, in those days, everything was short and there was a shortage of uniforms, but they didn't have any trouble getting uniforms. They were the very first to get them. The recruiting sergeant said, he said, well, you for God's sake, get them a uniform. I can't stand their clerical colors. Every time I look at them, it reminds me of my sins. <laughs> and it's not just ministers. Sometimes congregations are like that. You know, this, another sad thing, this is really confession good for this. So one of the other sad things about being a minister is that sometimes, occasionally, you meet people who've been to church for a lifetime and they have escaped all influence of grace. They're just as harsh and bitter and censorious as they've ever been. Dr. McCracken tells about one elder like that in a great church in New York City and one of his brother elders slipped. He stole money and he was arrested and convicted and sent to prison. And then when his sentence had been completed and he had paid his debt to society, he came back and asked to be readmitted to the church. And this elder said, No way, I won't have anything to do with this. I'll have no truck with a man who is a thief. Once a thief, always a thief. 
and so he voted against them. So much time spent in the house of God and so little grace. Not much healing in that. Not much setting of the broken limb in that, is there? Now, here's the thing to notice before we go on to our last point. It's when we bear our own burdens that we're able to carry the burdens of others. And it's when we carry the burdens of others that we're better fitted to carry our own. I would be useless to you in your doubts if I hadn't carried the burden of my own doubts and carry the burden still. The two men most helpful to people who have suffered nervous breakdown are two ministers whom I profoundly admire who themselves went through the dark valley and bore their own burden and now have a saving word for others. And it's when you carry the burdens of others that you get help in carrying your own. I mean, the worst people are the ones who are full of self-pity, always thinking about themselves, always lamenting and complaining about the heavy burdens they have to bear. Would God they'd get out and begin to experience the burdens of others? I talked to a woman not long ago, and she sat in the waiting room of a hospital. She said, when I came in, I was filled with complaint. And now that I've sat here a while, I have... Nothing to complain about. Brings me to the last thing. Really, the time has gone. But I'm going to say it anyway. It's a very short one. We bear our own burdens. We have ourselves on our hands. We bear the burdens of others. We get ourselves off our hands by caring for others. Here's the last thing. We cast our burdens upon God. We put ourselves in his hands. And here we go to the psalmist. Wasn't that exquisite as the choir sang it in our psalm? Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain thee. Says Peter, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. You can do that, he says, because God loves you. You are his charge. Now, One of the most helpful things that I find in carrying my own burdens is to limit the load. It's just to realize that I don't have to do everything. I don't have to preach all the sermons, nearly all of them, but not all of them. I don't have to conduct all the funerals or marry all the young people. I'm not responsible for all the Christian education and for the music and for pastoral care and so on. You have given me, a, no minister ever had a more faithful or competent or gracious staff than I have in this church. And it just means that the load is limited. Morley does some and Alec and Carl and, and all the others who are so splendid about Now you see, the thing is, I've got to trust them. I've got to allow them to do it. If I try to carry the whole load, I won't be able to do it. Sometimes I think of this when I'm on the 401, and you know those big heavy trucks, they have to pull off to the weigh scales. And sometimes they're told, this vehicle is too heavily loaded. Some people are like that. We ought to weigh people. If we we could weigh their worries from time to time, they're carrying too heavy a load. And Jesus said, don't be worrying about tomorrow. You can't do anything about that. It will break you if you try to do tomorrow's work in today's strength, just today. So I trust people to carry their part of the load and I do the bit that I must do. But you have to trust people. I followed a minister in a church once and when the church officer, when the custodian wanted to change an electric light bulb, he had to ask him for one. Then the minister gave it to him. And when the secretary wanted a stamp, she had to rap on his office door and ask him for a stamp. And he was constantly complaining that he was overworked. You have to trust. Tell me, do you trust God? Do you know what trusting God means? It just means allowing him to do what he will do if we will allow him to do it. That's what it means. It just means trusting him, that you don't have to do everything. There are some things that... God will do for you. He won't carry your burden. He'll do something better than that. Do you know what he'll do? He'll carry you and your burden. That's what he'll do. Love the story of the old woman in London, England during the war. And everybody marveled that she could sleep so well during the Blitz. And somebody asked her her secret. And she said, well, it's easy. It says in the book that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So I just reckon that that's true and I decide that there's no point in both of us staying awake so I say my prayers. I say my prayers and then I say to hell with Hitler and then I go to sleep. (laughs) 
No, I preach as well as I can. But how you hear is not my responsibility. That's yours and it's God's. I leave that with him. So limit the load. Really do trust him. Allow him to do it. And he'll bring you through. Now I've finished. I've got to finish because the time is gone. I met a woman once who was a minister. And she lost her wee girl. And then her husband had a very serious nervous breakdown. But once I heard this woman pray, and I've never forgotten it. I've shared it with you before. Let me tell it to you again with these words. We, we'll, we'll finish the service. She said, O thou who art the strength and courage of our hearts, give us brave hearts that we may bear our own burden." and loving hearts that we may bear the burdens of others, and believing hearts that we may cast all our burdens upon thee. Can you do it? He'll give you grace.